Welcome to ICAPG Assembly. This is a special episode with two promising postgraduates in anesthesiology presenting on laryngeal surgery and tracheostomy. We have a guest faculty Dr. Jayakumar Menon, to give laryngologists perspective to the discussion and share his experience in laryngeal surgeries. Senior faculty Dr. Vimi Rawari and Dr. Sanjeev Palta are the moderators. You are welcome to post your comments too. Thanks again for joining ICA webinar. Here we go. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our series of ICA webinars, uh, which we are proudly presenting for the last two years. And today is the 139th webinar, and we're very honored that we always have special guests and our ICA faculty members who join us. Today is a very interesting topic, which is on laryngotracheal surgery, perioperative concerns. Of course, the moderators are three of them, very eminent faculty, Dr. Vimi Tiwari, who is a professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She has several publications and several interests, including critical care, pain, liver transplant anesthesia, and obstetric anesthesia. Our guest lecture is being given by Dr. Jack Mar Menon, who is the director at the Jack Mars Institute of Laryngology, Laryngology in Trivandrum, Kerala. And a third moderator that we have today is Dr. Sanjeev Palta. He is the professor and head of the department at the GMCH, Chandigarh. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the guest speaker for today, Dr. Jay, Jay Kumar R. Menon. Dr. Jay Kumar, please. Thank you, Dr. Vimi and uh, Dr. Gayasri, Madam. And good evening all. And a special thanks to my colleague Sanish for uh, giving this opportunity to be with you uh, to discuss the laryngeal surgery and its anesthesia. So we'll be talking about when Sanish talked about, uh, told me about this particular academic program, I was really impressed. And uh, he told about, you know, why, why don't we uh, do a session on the laryngeal surgery? Because I think that is a very key area because both the surgeon and the anesthetist share the same, same space. So th th that can be sometimes tricky, but sometimes it can be helpful too. Now, we all know that the functions of the larynx, even though it is called voice box, voice is actually only the third function. But I just put it as uh, voice as the first because we are uh, talking about the surgeries of the larynx today. So it can be, it, it, it is important in voice production, it is important in swallowing, protecting the airway, and it is uh, it is important in the airway. And here in this picture, we can see one of the nature's marvel. Uh, the snake has got a larynx, which is actually pulled by the powerful geniohyoid muscle to the, its lower incisor. And you can see that the cartilage in a, the glottis is completely cartilaginous. There is no membrane is formed. So what are its effects? One, the, uh, when the snake swallow a bigger a prey, much bigger than the size of its head, it is not going to suffocate and die because the geniohyoid will pull the trachea or the larynx towards the lower incisor, making it almost like a nature's tracheostomy. And second is that it is entirely cartilaginous. The glottic aperture is entirely cartilaginous. So at burst, snake can only, it cannot produce much sound like uh, higher animals. But it look, I, I, I suppose that anesthetist might find it very tempting to intubate a snake. It looks so easy. The larynx is very, very close. Just keep the mouth open and put the tube in it. Anyway, I know that is not easy, but just on the lighter side. Now, what I am going to discuss today is about the laryngeal surgeries. We have already seen that larynx deal with the voice, deal with the swallowing, deal with the airway tract. Consequently, you can have three different sets of surgeries. Phono surgery is, the, is a group of surgery done to improve, alter, or regain the voice. And phago surgery is the set of surgeries done to improve, alter, or regain the function of swallowing. And airway tract surgery is the most challenging among them where we are trying to correct a damaged or a compromised upper airway. 
and all these three subgroups can be endoscopic or open. Now, you now the fashion is to, uh, to do as much endoscopic as possible because of the less morbidity, less hospitalization, and consequently less expensive. But in, in not in every case you can do an endoscopic procedure. You may have to resort to open surgeries too. So what we are going to discuss today is that how the laryngologist specialize the, the, the procedure and what he or she expect from his uh, anesthesia colleagues. And I think nowhere in other, no other field uh, require this much of uh, a very coordinated uh, working pattern uh, between the surgeon and the anesthetist. And both of them should have actually confidence in the capability of the others. Then only the actually to the teamwork and, and uh, both the confidence and the panicking are infective. If the surgeon is not confident of the anesthetist, uh, the panic can easily set in. And the same thing happens with the other way around. If the anesthetist is not familiar or com confident of the surgeon's ability. So to, set, to get the airway, to make the airway safe is actually of prime importance and especially in airway surgery. So to work as a team, the team, the surgeon, the laryngologist and the anesthetist has to be very familiar with each other, their own strengths and weakness, how we should deal with and who should take over in each scenario. That, that is what is more important. That's, that is in a sense this uh, talk is about. What the laryngologist expect from his anesthesia colleagues. We come to the phono surgery. That means surgery is done to improve or alter or regain the voice. Vast majority of the phono surgeries are endoscopic. Say like you can say uh, 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 this is a cyst, so poor lips, cyst, congenital condition, scarring of the vocal cord like sulcus vocalis, benign uh, neoplasms like papilloma and carcinoma. So they all are generally dealt with what is generally known as or generically known as micro laryngeal surgery either with the use of a mic operating microscope or more preferably as uh, i am used to do something known as the operating video laryngoscope which gives a lot of magnification and you can see you can operate or, or the with uh, with your eyes set on the monitor so what we expect so what are the things uh, what are the special anesthetic consideration for micro laryngeal surgery obviously we should have the microlaryngeal tube. It gives uh, much more working space for the surgeon to operate, you know, comfortably. They, they all are very precision surgery. So we need to, uh, to negotiate, to uh, manipulate our instruments. They all are, of course, finer, very delicate instruments, but still we need a lot of rooms to, to, to be uh, uh, able to perform good precision surgeries because the precision of the surgery is of extreme importance. Even a small extra excision of the, uh, the vocal cord tissue can result in permanent vocal damage. So that is very important. What most of the general uh, the laryngologists would prefer is actually an orotracheal tube rather than a nasotracheal tube. I've seen in some centers at least people going thinking that a, new, a nasotracheal tube is actually preferable for the oral sur laryngeal surgery. It is actually not... Uh, a right concept because a nasotracheal tube actually is more of a hindrance to the laryngologist uh, uh, when you compare it with an orotracheal tube. And if the surgeon is a right-handed surgeon, vast majority will be the right-handed people. So in case of a right-handed surgeon, the, the tube need to be fixed to the left side of the angle of the mouth of the patient because the natural movement of the right-handed surgeon is move like that. So he actually move with his right hand from the right corner of the uh, angle of the right angle of the mouth of the patient. So it is preferable to keep the tube irrespective of the side of the lesion. It doesn't matter whether, whether the vocal cord uh, lesion is on the right or the left. The endotracheal tube is preferably kept on the left side. Of course, it will change with the left-handed surgeon. And the second important point is that cuff need to be little bit below than usual. If the cuff is in the subglottis, immediate subglottis, the, there are chances that, that uh, the surgeon might puncture it because we use a lot of sharp instruments like needles, knives, sharp scissors. And not only that, it also is a hindrance to the precision of the surgery. So ideally, 
the bulb should be below the cricoids and uh, there should be enough space enough space for manipulation of the instrument that is very very important these are the main things high potency when a c shape is certainly preferable uh, even if it is not there it shouldn't be high potency if the bp goes to 130 and above then uh, the bleeding bleeding become very cumbersome and surgery become more delayed and difficult. The precision is going to be difficult. So it is important to have the BP under control. A relative uh, high potency when a CCA will be of great use uh, to the surgeon. And usually the, this will be the, the, the position of the patient. It's in a neutral position, no extension or uh, no flexion. Maybe a small uh, head ring below, behind, below the head and the um, Mayo stand is just above the chest and abdomen so that you can actually fix the suspension and the monitor is usually on the right side of the patient. So you can see, watch the video and then do the surgery. Now the second group. So the vast majority, if, if in a laryngology surgical theater, surgery theater, uh, yeah, so around 70% of uh, surgeries will be endoscopic. And uh, maybe around 30% will be external. Out of the external surgery, phonosurgery, the commonly commonly performed group is known as thyroplasty. The, after it's the initiator or the founder, Dr. Nobuhiko Ishiki from Japan, who passed away last year at the ripe old age of 92. Uh, but it is more ideally called laryngeal framework surgery. So you can modify the laryngeal framework, the relation between the cricoid thyroid and arytenoid. These three cartilages can be modified for different surgeries. There are five thyroplasties previously called type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 and arytenoid rotation. Type 1 is mainly done for unilateral vocal cord palsy. Type 2 is for um, uh, spasmodic dysphonia. Type 3 for puberphonia and type 4 androphonia. The important thing and the interesting thing is that this, the all these surgeries are done under local anesthesia with fairly heavy sedation. So this is a monitored anesthesia care. Why it is so? Because we fix the, we are altering the relation between the thyroid, cricoid and arytenoid. And we need to listen to the voice. So we actually finally fix the position of the thyroid, cricoid or whatever implant you put there after listening to the patient's voice and then deciding, okay, this is the most optimum voice. Suppose a patient has got a unilateral vocal cord pulse, his voice will be like something like will be very, very hoarse, very breathy. So you need to put an implant and put the vocal cord so that the paralyzed vocal cord go and meet the normal vocal cord. If you undercorrect, the voice will be still breathy. It may not be, it will be better, but it is not very good. If you overcorrect, it will be strainful. So it is very important. You have to listen to the voice and then fix the implant. So that is why all the thyroplasties, all the laryngeal framework surgeries are to be done under monitored anesthesia care. This is the, the still picture of a commonest performed, commonly, most commonly performed thyroplasty, type 1 thyroplasty, or uh, more correctly, more descriptively, it should be known as the medialization thyroplasty, which is done for unilateral vocal cord palsy. I can just show you a sample here, this patient, and how the voice changes during surgery. Uh, here, here, this is the patient, first got a relatively breathy voice. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh... Now you can see that this is neck is open, the implant is in position and you are checking how is the voice. Now the voice is very good. That means the thickness of the implant is perfect. You can also check with the flexible laryngoscope at the time. So, so for that purpose, you cannot have an endotracheal tube there. So general anesthesia is out of question, monitored anesthesia care. And uh, this is heavy, fairly big sedation with the advent of dexmedetomidine that has become much easier for us. Uh, and you can check the voice. So this is how the thyroplasties or laryngeal framework surgery. As I told, there are five types of laryngeal framework surgery. So the, each different, uh, Dr. Sanish will be very familiar with all these things because he is my colleague there. So uh, the different types of thyroplasties, 
all require this particular feature that patient should be arousable from the from the sedation and should be able to speak to the surgeon during the procedure. Now coming to the phago surgery, that means surgery done to retrieve or correct the swallowing uh, problem. Again, like phono surgery, it can be endoscopic, it can be external. The commonly, most commonly performed endoscopic surgery will be the stricture dilatation many times after surgery, after radiation, after trauma, and sometimes congenital and a patient can have actually uh, stricter or narrowing of the esophagus or the element upper uh, digestive tract, which of course require dilatation. Injection of Botox into the cricopharynx is not a rare uh, condition now. For conditions like idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm, uh, early uh, Senkesh diverticulum, all can be done endoscopically. Cricopharyngeal myotomy, so, sorry for that spelling mistake, cricopharyngeal myotomy uh, is again indicated for idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm and pharyngeal pouch stapling. So all these conditions require general anesthesia with orotracheal intubation. And the, here the difference is that since we are dealing with the pharynx rather than with the larynx, uh, uh, there is no harm in using a bigger standard endotracheal tube. No need of using a microlaryngeal tube because we are not going to the picture. This is a classical case of pharyngeal pouch, how it will look endoscopically. Uh, you can see that there are two lumens in this particular video. Uh, the lower one, which one you are seeing very clearly is the pharyngeal pouch. And this is the idiopathic cricopharyngeal spasm. And the upper lumen is the esophagus through which you can see the, the rice tube is going. So in endoscopic surgery, you can actually stapler, uh, you can use the stapler there, or you can use the laser to cut the cri cricopharyngeal muscle and staple it on either side. So that you do a sort of... Um, uh, marsupialization, converting the pharyngeal pouch into the main lumen of the uh, esophagus. So this uh, can be done endoscopically. Of course, this is a surgery can be also done uh, through an external approach. Now, sometimes this is done external, especially when the uh, pouch is big. So here, it is just like any thyroid surgery, like standard neck surgery. You can have general anesthesia with either or tracheal or nasotracheal doesn't matter now because it is an external surgery. Uh, uh, here you can see this is the cricopharyngeal myotomy. The cricopharynx has been cut here and you can see the mucosa, intact mucosa of the cricopharynx and upper esophagus. So that, that constricting effect of the muscles are gone. So uh, something like this, you can see uh, the esophagus, esophageal and pharyngeal mucosa is bulging that uh, the, uh, the artery forceps is pointing to the mucosa. It is better you don't enter the mucosa. It's not a great crime, but if you cut the chance of infection and uh, future scarring may be a little higher. So it is preferable keep the uh, mucosa intact, but you cut the muscle. Now coming to the most challenging field in laryngology, that is the airway tract surgery. Again, just like any other surgery, here again, it can be endoscopic and it can be open. Now, in endoscopy, we can have different scenario regarding the anesthesia. First is that the patient has already a tracheostomy because of the upper airway issue. Say, like patient has got a bilateral cord palsy uh, with a very compromised glottic airway or a severe subglottic stenosis. All these things, patient already will have a tracheostomy. So they, when they're coming to the laryngologist or the airway surgeon, they already have a tracheostomy. So here, we don't have that much of problem. The only thing we will expect is that a flexometallic endotracheal tube through the tracheostomy side and under general anesthesia. We can do a lot of surgeries like Kashima surgery, which is actually a, a laser-assisted posterior cordotomy suture cordopexy, arytenoidectomy, they all are surgeries for bilateral cord palsy, something like that. Here you can see that this is the uh, anterior cut end of the left vocal cord with a laser. You are just dis, dis, uh, separating the membranous cartilaginous cord anteriorly from the arytenoid posteriorly. So that the, because of the re inherent retractile property, uh, the vocal cord retracts and get enough space. You can also do this kind of surgery in soft subglottic and upper tracheal stenosis too. So this is not a very big problem area because already the airway is secured. 
So uh, what we need is only a pass, uh, changing the conventional tracheostomy and putting an endotracheal tube there. Now, you can have an endoscopic airway tract surgery without tracheostomy. Means patient has got some breathing difficulty, but uh, uh, is still okay. So in that case, you can do still do an endotracheal intubation with a smaller tube, or if it is a like soft genosis like laryngomalacian bilateral vocal port tube, also you can actually easily put the same size. The standard size tracheostomy can be uh, put, and and also it can be done for laryngeal and pharyngeal masses like big cyst tumors, hamartomas like uh, hemangioma and lymphangioma. Here you can see that. Uh, this is actually a glottic web. You can see the right, the left vocal cord, the right vocal cord, the anterior commissure, uh, the ventricle, the ventricular band, the area glottic fold. All this can be seen. So here, uh, the, the anesthetist has passed a relatively smaller size endotracheal tube through the posterior glottis, and the surgeon can actually work either with the cold knife, like here, what I am showing, with a sharp upcutting scissors, or you can use uh, carbon dioxide laser to cut that thing. Uh, regarding the laser and other powder uh, powered instrument, uh, we will talk in little detail a few slides later. So this kind of surgery is uh, their endoscopic procedure, but without tracheostomy. So selection of case has to be important. Here already patient has got a reasonable array. At least patient is not having a dyspnea at trust. He or she may have a dyspnea on exertion. That's okay. We can manage them. So any patient who has got just dyspnea on exertion actually should become better with the surgery. So they don't need to do undergo a tracheostomy. If a bilateral vocal cord palsy is okay at rest, absolutely no need to do a tracheostomy. We can intubate and do the, the standard static widening procedure and do the surgery. Now, the third group, airway tract surgery without tracheostomy, without intubation. So again, uh, here there are different methods. This is especially for the subglotic and tracheal stenosis, infraglotic mass, uh, where an intubation will actually make the vis visibility of the surgeon very difficult. No, he can't see it properly. So there are many methods. One will be actually a jet ventilation, put the jet, there are different methods of jet ventilation. You can put it through the blade of the laryngoscope. You can put it as separate thing, or you can put it even through the cricothyroid space. This is a case of subglotic, soft subglotic stenos. That, that is the jet ventilation cannula there that was uh, into the subglotis, put under anesthesia, then temporarily taken out, and then the dilatory is being used. You can, you could dip, and in between, you can again go in, with the uh, 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 jet and then do it again so that you get a more time. You can use different type of uh, 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 ventilation technique. Of course, try uh, anybody who is familiar with the neonatal and uh, pediatric airway anesthesia will be very familiar with that. That's a uh, uh, transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange, uh, which again we use uh, in uh, cases where we need to work on uh, subglotic narrowing. But uh, some of them may not be a suitable case. Suppose there is a chance of bleeding is small. Uh, suppose there is a chance of uh, seedling. Say you are operating on a papilloma virus, recurrent respiratory papilloma virus, then these procedures may not be of a, a great thing because by pushing, you can actually cause seedling. So you have to be very careful in selecting all these patients. You can also do what is known as the apneic technique, ventilation with intermittent apnea. And anesthetist ventilate, maintains the saturation, quickly comes out of, surgeon goes in, do the work, and when the saturation starts to dip, or whenever the anesthetist, anesthetist is, is the person who is in command, whenever the anesthetist says that you have to move, the surgeon move, again go back. So this cycle is repeated, and you can actually get a good outcome uh, without uh, needing to resort to a tracheostomy. Or, or even intubation. Now, bronchoscopy, not every laryngologist will be doing. Uh, a different uh, hospital has got different policy with now flexible. Uh, the rigid bronchoscopy has come down, but still uh, in some places it is like airway, the, the, the cardiothoracic surgeons are doing, 
in some places it is the pediatric surgeons are doing in some places the ent surgeons or the laryngologists will be doing so we, here we use the ventilating bronchoscope so we need to pass the ventilating bronchoscope through the the glottis into the uh, uh, into the bronchus and to the area of pathology and do the necessary diagnostic or therapeutic procedure here again the difference here is that uh, you are not getting a seal so there will be obviously leak uh, the oxygen leak will be around even if you are actually closing the bronchoscope so uh, again a, a very close cooperation between the anesthetist and the surgeon is needed each time uh, anesthetist feel that the saturation is coming down or uh, it's not in the right direction uh, uh, maybe even the, uh, they can ventilate through the ventilating bronchoscope itself or the surgeon has to come out of the bronchus from the bronchoscope and then uh, the anesthetist may have to intubate temporarily. Now coming to the airway tract surgery, open airway tract. Uh, there are only five, six surgeries, but they are the most challenging surgeries. So the uh, most commonly, so airway tract surgery means when you are dealing with a damaged, compromised upper airway like a supraglottic, glottic, subglottic, or tracheal stenosis. So uh, the most commonly performed uh, surgery with the tracheostomy, always with the tracheostomy are anterior cricoid split, something like that. This is a costal cartilage graft uh, for a uh, subglottic, severe subglottic stenosis. So this you need to have a tracheostomy. And hope generally, all these patients with a subglottic problem has got a normal trachea, so that shouldn't be a problem. And posterior cricoid split is actually you are splitting the posterior cricoid lamina, do you know? In anterior cricoid split, you split the arch of the cricoid and put an implant, costal cartilage graft. In posterior cricoid split, you put the split the posterior cricoid and put an implant. That is for a posterior glottic stenosis where the vocal cords are fused together posteriorly at the cricoid node joint. And there is another operation called extended PCTR or partial cricotracheal resection. They all of them require tracheostomy. Without tracheostomy, you can't do. Now, the imp important second interesting group is that the airway tract surgery, open airway tract surgery, which you can do without a tracheostomy. Of course, there are two options. And they are known as, uh, commonly known as a single stage surgery or two stage surgery. In single stage surgery means at the end of the surgery, there is no tracheostomy. You may keep the endotracheal tube for one day or so. Then extubate. But now the fashion is that you extubate on the table. But I still follow 24 hour uh, intubation and then take out. So, like tracheal resection. So, this is a tracheal resection anastomosis, a tracheal uh, resection. Here is the trachea, the narrow damage segment is resected. It may be up to six to even sometimes up to eight rings can be resected. And then uh, that the other ends of mobilized and sutured over an endotracheal tube and 24 hours later, you extubate it. But you have to keep the uh, patient in the ICU for uh, at least uh, seven days or even 10 days till the dreaded complication of wound dehiscence or tracheal dehiscence is over. Uh, with uh, more experience, uh, the, the, uh, with uh, experience for both surgeons and the anesthetist, the result has become much better. Nowadays, I prefer to uh, do a single stage tracheal resection than a, a, a two stage. Two stage means you do a lower tracheostomy, much lower tracheostomy below the site of anastomosis. While it gives a sort of comfort to the surgeon and anesthetist uh, in that, you know, there is an airway beeline. But the problem is that the long term results are distinctly inferior to single stage. By doing a tracheostomy lower down, you are actually introducing the chance of infection and introducing the chance of wound uh, tracheal dehiscence. So complications are actually higher, review, uh, re stenosis is higher. And same is the condition, partial cricotracheal resection. When a severe subglottic stenosis, you can take out the anterior cricoid arch and you can anastomose trachea to the thyroid. Here again, you can do as a single stage without tracheostomy. And in a long segment of tracheal stenosis, especially seen in the children with uh, uh, cardiac anomalies, you can do slight tracheoplasty, where of course you need the, uh, the heart-lung machine. You have to bypass the oxygenation procedure for the time being, but again, after operation, no intubation.
Now, just few more slides about the even more challenging, more difficult neonatal and pediatric airway surgeries. Of course, anesthesia is far more challenging. You, you, I'm sure that you all know this, uh, this scenario, the three group. The first is can ventilate, can intubate. They are straightforward cases. Suppose a baby, a neonate comes. We, we many times do a tracheostomy on the day one when there is a bilateral cord palsy. But here the problem is not very great because the anesthetist can ventilate, can intubate. Not a very difficult issue for an experienced uh, pediatric anesthetist. That shouldn't be a problem. The second problem is a little more difficult. Can ventilate, but cannot intubate. Intubation is technically difficult. There may be, it may be very narrow. We are very, very uh, uh, blessed in the sense that we have got a very experienced uh, pediatric uh, airway anesthetist like uh, Dr. Gunga Kumar, Dr. Srivijaya, and Dr. Sunny, school days people actually. Uh, they are very, very well experienced people and uh, they, they, they do a lot of help to our people. And of course, uh, they are just like uh, 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 the Health. Now, what is more important is, is that uh, when uh, we cannot intubate, we have to plan a tracheostomy under mask or laryngeal mask anesthesia so that that, that particular period uh, they can maintain the oxygenation and we can do. But the most difficult condition is can't ventilate, can't intubate. That's a real uh, threatening scenario. Uh, the time available is very, very, very short. So we have to do either a cricothyrotomy, either an open cricothyrotomy. That means you, you uh, stab or uh, uh, cut open that area and enter the cricothyroid space. There is no major structure except for an impossible anterior jugular vein. Even it, if it bleeds, it shouldn't be an issue. You can always stop. Or you can do a needle, needle cricothyrotomy. You don't have the time or the facility to do a cricothyrotomy, then you actually pass a bigger needle into the cricothyrotomy. But this cricothyrotomy can be actually done only in an older child, say maybe above the age of say six or seven or eight. Below that, that cricothyroid space may not be very great. In those children, it is better you go for needle tracheotomy rather than a needle cricothyrotomy because cricothyroid space is much narrower than, than a Trachea. So in those children, you go for the for the needle tracheotomy. And uh, neonatal and pediatric tracheostomy are challenging. It needs a lot of teamwork, but it is ultimately rewarding. Uh, you are actually saving the life. And when uh, it has been going on for so much of time, every member of the team becomes familiar with that. And consequently, the morbidity and the mortality all come down. Finally, Powered instruments. Now, there are lots of powered instruments like coblator, micro debrider, but the laser is the key. And in the larynx, the main laser used is the carbon dioxide. Of course, you can use other laser, but always avoid the chance of the fire. Both the anesthetist and surgeon should be always ready for that thing. You can avoid by the using the laser flux tubes, lower the fractional uh, FiO2 of the oxygen, all these things. But a, an experienced surgeon and anesthetist, however uh, careful they may be, they should be always ready for the, the management of an acute laser airway fire. And uh, there should be a protocol how to manage a laser fire. So this, uh, a, uh, I just want to conclude uh, the talk saying that these are the things where we actually interact very freely. The surgeon is heavily dependent on the anesthetist and so is anesthetist because the, getting the airway is important. And I think most of the time you can actually uh, uh, manage this situation. It is very rarely only you know you actually you have to to raise your hands and accept defeat. But with more and more experience and more and more cooperation, the results should be better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jay Kumar. For a wonderful lecture, I think he gave us a very good overview about all the possible uh, surgeries involving the larynx and the trachea. And uh, I think ENT surgeons are one of the very few surgeons who are really um, 
well versed with the anesthesia techniques and i was very impressed with your knowledge of anesthesia and ways to handle the airway uh, talking about lmas and cmax video laryngoscopes and uh, and i find uh, it most comforting and rewarding to work with ent i do uh, ent test uh, list very regularly and it's my favorite theater to work in actually because i find the surgeon so comfortable to work with so thank you so much for a wonderful lecture i think all the participants would have gained a lot about the different kinds of surgeries and uh, if we have any questions or ch on the chat i think you've explained everything so beautifully i don't think there is any need for any questions and uh, just wanted to ask you one question about your experience with laryngeal clefts in uh, very small children neonates so uh, what kind of uh, anesthesia uh, is generally preferred in these kind of surgeries because they are very tricky in my opinion the laryngeal clefts yeah uh, the, the type 1 and the, the uh, smaller clefts the type 1 and type 2 usually can be type 1 always can be managed endoscopically and most of the type 2s also can be managed endoscopically uh, but uh, the, the bigger cleft obviously require uh, uh, open procedure. Now, if we can still do with an endotracheal tube uh, by carefully positioning the tube, moving away from it and then do. The second option is doing a tracheostomy and then doing the cleft surgery. This is especially so if the chance, if the aspiration is high, Already, baby's lower uh, respiratory tract is not very, uh, not very great. But both has got its advantage and disadvantage. The advantage of avoiding the tracheostomy is that you are, you know, avoiding an infection and uh, and also the other uh, potential complications of the tracheostomy. But the disadvantage of the endotracheal tube is that you are actually, if you are keeping the endotracheal tube longer in, in that postoperative period, the chance of wound breakdown is actually high. So, but I still will do with an endotracheal tube. I will try to avoid a tracheostomy unless there is a lower, significant lower respiratory uh, pathology. So, we won't be doing that sort of thing generally. And we'll try to extubate as early as possible and uh, manage them with a non-invasive non -invasive support. Right. Thank you. So, we generally also use this intermittent apnea, you know, intubate the yeah, child and then... Right. And we've uh, recently done a few cases using high flow nasal ca cannula also. So that has also given us good results because the surgeons are very happy because they get, get a very clean view, unhindered field to work in. So I've, we found this technique very useful. Yeah, but suturing sometimes can be tricky. Sometimes right. it may take, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah. a lot of time. So it depends. It depends unpredictable. So yeah, apneic ventilation and with a tube, tubeless technique is okay. But if it is troublesome, I will still go for a tube, uh, position it in such a way that uh, it doesn't come into your picture and then do it. Right, right, right. Dr. Palta, do you have any questions for Dr. Jayakumar? I have no questions. Thank you, Dr. Vimi. Okay. So, uh, if we don't have any questions, then we can move on to the next presentation. Dr. Sinish, yes. is it all yes. right? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. We'll proceed with the next one. So, the next presenter is Dr. Niharika Das. She is a third year junior resident at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And she's going to be talking about anesthesia for laryngeal surgery. Uh, a very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, today, we are going to discuss about the anesthesia for laryngeal surgery presented by me and moderated by Dr. Vimi Ma'am. The topic will be discussed uh, in basis of the pre-anesthetic assessment, the intraoperative concerns, the choice of the anesthetic technique, the airway and the ven ven airway and ventilation, which we're going to do, the major concerns of laryngeal surgery, uh, laser surgery in laryngeal surgeries, and the modes of apneic ventilation and the post-operative concerns. Coming uh, to the introduction, we'll have the we know that the laryngeal surgeries are performed and to improve the respiratory function, to improve phonation, or to resect the diseased tissue. The anesthetic concerns include the potential difficulty with the airway management and the shared airway, which requires a close coordination. 
we have two groups of patient population that come to us. One group is the young, fit and, fit and healthy population that presents with hoarseness of the voice for nodules, polyps, and cysts, and or vocal cord granulomas and papillomas. The granulomas are mostly because of uh, trauma due to extubation or intubation. So here we can see a picture of a vocal nodule. The vocal nodules are usually bilateral and can be treated mostly by conservative management. And the vocal polyp is usually unilateral. Then we have the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. Such patients usually present with strider and they present to the ENT surgeons a repeated number of times for the excision of these papillomas. Then we have the vocal cord granulomas. Note the presence of the granuloma in the posterior third of the vocal cord. Now, the second group of people are these elderly patients which have multiple systemic comorbidities, which are mostly chronic smokers or has a history of alcohol intake. They, they present with malignant tumors of the vocal cord, usually in the middle third of the vocal cord, and the treatment includes local resection, radiotherapy, and hemilaryngectomy or laryngectomy. Now, these patients, they present with the hoarseness of voice, the voice change, and there can be strider, dysphagia. Uh, if the mass is large, there can be obstructive sleep apnea, and the patient might not be able to lie flat. We also have to make note of the breathing position in which the patient is most comfortable before inducing and taking up the case. Now, the most important thing is that we have to assess the airway and accordingly plan and the direct or the indirect laryngoscopy view to assess the size, sight, and mobility of the lesion and to assess the vocal cord, uh, whether the functioning of the vocal cord is adequate or not and whether any palsy is present. Uh, we have to note that any very mobile lesions like papillomas or polyps may cause partial airway obstruction after induction or if we are using a spontaneous induction technique. Spontaneous ventilation is an induction technique. Now, in the intraoperative concerns, these are the major topics where we will ponder upon the technique of the induction, the airway. So, uh, here is the ideal shared airway. Uh, here we'll have, there's, uh, we want that there is no risk of aspiration and there is adequate oxygenation and ventilation. There is a smooth induction and maintenance and there is a clear motionless surgical field. There are no time restrictions on the surgeon. There is a smooth emergence and a pain-free, comfortable, alert patient at the end of the surgery is the desire from both the ends. Now, uh, coming to the choice of the anesthetic technique, let's move the cursor. Uh, we have two groups of two sets of population where the when airway compromise is an issue and where the airway compromise is not an issue. Now, uh, when the airway compromise is not an issue, certain surgeries, the laryngeal endoscopic surgeries are performed under GA. The IV induction is usually performed. The neuromuscular blockade is given. Once we have made sure we're able to ventilate the patient and the maintenance can be done. We're using inhalational or intravenous anesthesia. Now, IV agents are used like propofol if the tubeless methods are chosen. Now, uh, if but if the airway compromise is an issue, for example, uh, there's a large mass or there's papillomatosis, traditionally we have suggested that inhalational induction with spontaneous ventilation is uh, can be done, but because they, that can be done, but as the larger airways are stented open by the negative intrathoracic pressure that is generated during inspiration. However, there are multiple physiological problems associated with spontaneous ventilation and inhalation induction, and these include the uh, reduction in the airflow, the increased collapsibility of the airway, the increased work of breathing sustained by the patient, there are critical instability at points of narrowing in the airway, the slower induction with apneic periods, the episodes of obstruction that might occur, and the most important thing is that the concentration that is required by the patient to uh, achieve an adequate depth for intubation or for any area manipulation is very high and that will cause a hemodynamic instability. And if we attempt to secure the airway or to do any laryngeal maneuver, any laryngeal 
uh, manipulation. During an inadequate depth, it will lead to immediate laryngospasm or bronchospasm, which is not desirable. Now, uh, we have different, now, so this is the two techniques, two ways where we can do induction. Now, moving ahead, we will go into the airway management and ventilation plan. Now, we'll have a closed system or open system. If you're using a closed system, we can go by cuffed endotracheal intubation. And if you're going by an open system, there are multiple techniques like by spontaneous ventilation, the insufflation technique, the intermittent apneic technique, the muscle paralysis and jet ventilation, and the much talked about the TRIVE, the transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange. All the topics will be discussed in detail in the upcoming slides. Now, uh, moving ahead with the cuffed endotracheal intubation. It secures the airway, it prevents leakage of anesthetic gases or oxygen, it prevents the soiling of the lung with blood or debris, but the issue comes with the interference of the visualization and dissection of the lesion. For that, we have the microlaryngeal tubes, and for laser surgeries, we have the laser-resistant tubes. Now, a microlaryngeal tube, as we can see on the picture, uh, here there is a microlaryngeal tube and here is a standard tube. The size of both of them are 5 millimeter internal diameter. So this is a standard pediatric tube. The, we can see the length of the cuff from the tip is longer in case of a microlaryngeal tube. So as Sir had said, we can place the, uh, the tip will be farther away. Now the cuff is also an adult cuff. And as we can see on the next slide, the the length of the tube is quite longer and the size is smaller so it will be poor. it will not cover much of the glottis now there are different issues because of the smaller diameter that is a, it has a higher airway resistance there is difficulty in suctioning there is increased chances of kinking and occlusion and most importantly for laser surgeries it is a pvc tube and thus not laser resistant now, coming to the group of the laser resistant tubes, we have multiple tubes in use. The most important is the laser tubus. Uh, the laser tubus is resistant to most of the lasers and is most commonly used now. Other tubes will be discussed in detail in the next slides. Now, the laser tubus, it is made up of white rubber. There is a cuff within a cuff design. And if the outer cuff is perforated by laser beam, the inner cuff will maintain the seal. The outer cuff is to be filled with saline and the shaft above the cuff is covered by corrugated silver foil and then by mercosil sponge. This is all uh, in the from the uh, proximal to the distal end it is covered. Now it should be moistened before use and most importantly it can be used with all kinds of laser. So here there is an image of the laser tube. Here we can see it is a white mercosil sponge and is covered uh, inside and outside there is a moist it's, it is moistened and here are the two cuffs the inner cuff and the outer cuff it is to be filled with saline so that any rupture can be easily noted and the saline will itself act as an extinguisher now the laser shield 2 tube now this tube it is made up of silicon and there is an aluminum wrap and an outer teflon coating it can only be used with carbon dioxide and ktp lasers the cuff which is made up of uh, pvc it actually contains methylene blue methylene blue helps us to know that if any leakage is there and it is inflated with saline now the disadvantages is that the cuff is not laser resistant and 1 cm above the cuff and the part distal to the cuff remains unprotected and the methylene blue crystals might itself obstruct the pilot tube. So here is the image taken from Benimov. You can see that this is the aluminum coating. This is a silicon tubing, and this is the cuff, and which contains the methylene blue. So here is a more zoomed image of the cuff containing methylene blue crystals inflated with saline. And there is a this part is not covered by the aluminum and teflon and thus has caught on fire when the laser was directed towards it. Now, uh, the laser flex tube. It is a stainless steel tube. There is a matte finish to reflect the laser beam. It is used with carbon dioxide and KTP lasers. There are uh, two PVC cuff and the PVC tip is there with, with a Murphy eye. Now, the cuff needs to be filled with methylene blue colored saline. Uh, so that it is noted and the distal is filled earlier and then the proximal cuff. But the disadvantages are that the, because it's a metal tube, there's a thick outer diameter. The surface is rough and it's a huge, uh, it's a very thick tube. So the, there's a time consuming to insert and for remove. 
removal. So here is the image showing the metallic tube and the two PVC cuff. The problem lies here in the cuff. So if any fire is directed here, there will it will uh, directly catch on fire since it's a PVC part. So here is a more zoomed image of the cuffs. The distal is filled earlier. And here's another image of it. Now the Sheridan laser tracheal tube. Now these tubes are not much in use. Uh, the red rubber tube it is wrapped, wrapped with a copper foil tape and is again wrapped with a water absorbent fabric. Now it is soaked with water prior to use and it's suitable for carbon dioxide and KTP lasers. Disadvantages again include the thick wall and the high pressure low volume cuff that comes with any red rubber tube. So here is the red rubber tube. Here is the high volume low pressure cuff. Here is the coating uh, wrapped with copper foil and then with the fabric. Now the Norton tube comes with the disadvantage that it's a reusable flexible spiral wound metal tube. The disadvantage includes a very thick tube and the angulation can also result in air leak and the exterior surface is rough. But if we go over all the laser resistant tube, this is the only tube which is laser proof because it is made up of stainless steel and all the other tubes, if uh, any laser is directed outside the group, outside our range, it will lead to fire, but this will not lead. This is the Norton tube. It is a cuffless tube and does the disadvantages of using a cuffless tube. And these are very, uh, these are rough and can lead to injury. Now the Bivona foam cuff laser tube, that is also not much in use. The aluminum and silicon coating is there. And there is a self-inflating cuff which is filled with saline and this should be deflated and inflated, uh, deflated during intubation and extubation. Now it retains the shape and maintains seal when punctured. That is the main use of the Bivona foam cuff laser tube. Now the issue is that there is silicon in it. So any injury, any uh, injury by laser will, it will burn and will slough off in the trachea and can lead to silicosis. So here is the Bivona cuff tube. Tracheostomy tubes of the same type are also available. Now, the, this is a very primitive method of making a laser resistant tube. It's a metal foil wrapped ETT. It is not now currently in use. Uh, here, when you wrap a metal around the tube in a, uh, in a direction so that it does not get hit, it doesn't get injured by the laser, but the, inj but the issues like that, there is no cuff protection here. It adds to the thickness of the tube and the laser can be reflected from this metal taping into the other non-targeted tissues and there will be injury. There might be injury by this rough surfaces. Now, uh, since we are dealing with laser tubes, so we have to know about the concerns that are associated with laser surgeries. The main issue is the laser hazards which we have and the airway fires. And so we have an ASA operating algorithm which we should follow while doing a laser surgery. So here we can see there are mainly three sources. There are mainly three uh, things which can lead to a fire and will be discussed later on. Uh, the classification of laser, this slide is important to know that the medical lasers all fall within class four and we need, that is why we need all the precautions uh, because these lasers are dangerous uh, to, um, to eye, skin and combustible material. Now the carbon dioxide laser is the most commonly used lasers in ENT surgeries. The Why is it used most commonly? Because the, it is a long, it is a very large wavelength and the depth of penetration is less and the it is water absorption is very high and it ablates the tissue and also uh, it is used for laryngeal surgeries which which for which we require superficial uh, coagulation superficial thermal activity now uh, here we can see that they are pointing it but this is actually a pointer that comes with the carbon dioxide laser and this is not uh, not actually the laser this is a helium neon pointer we have to align this helium neon pointer with the carbon dioxide pointer so that the surgeon can know exactly where to focus the laser now the laser hazards the most important is the eye damage that can occur to the patient or to us the laser plumes and the airway laser hazards now, uh, the most importantly, when we are doing a laser surgery, the OR room should have a warning sign and the door should automatically be closing and opening so that no other person from other place comes without any protective eyewear. 
The eye damage with carbon dioxide laser, since it's a large wavelength laser, it occurs only by the occurs only in the cornea, not to the retina. And the patient's eye should be taped closed. The saline soaked uh, eye patch should be used. And for OR stuff, the regular transparent eye glasses with side covers will provide protection for carbon dioxide lasers. Now, the skin and drape, the most important thing is that it, we should avoid alcohol containing sterile swabs and carbon dioxide fire extinguisher should be available in the OT. And uh, the disposable surgical drapes, which are water resistant, are more dangerous than the normal linen drapes. Now, the laser plumes. This is an important hazard for the airway, for the surgeon and also for the patient. These are produced by the carbon dioxide laser because of the water absorption and the charring of the tissues. When absorbed, it can lead to interstitial pneumonia, bronchiolitis, reduction in the mucociliary clearance, and the emphysema. The laser protective mask should be used, and uh, our normal mask does not filter that much, so we should use laser protective mask. Also, a topic of controversy is that the laser plume, when used over papilloma virus, wherever papilloma uh, papillomatosis can lead to viral particle uh, production, but that is not uh, not yet. Uh, like proved in all the studies. Now, the gas embolism can occur with a flexible fiber uh, carbon dioxide laser because of the pressurized gas exiting the tip. It is mostly reported with the ND YAG laser. Now, the airway laser, laser hazards, the triad which we had seen, which we're going to discuss now, that there are three things which should be paid attention at all the time. First, the ignition source, that is the laser. Then the oxidizer, that is if you're using 100% oxygen, oxygen or nitrous together on, and the fuel that includes the hair drapes or everything that needs to be paid attention. Now the airway fires, any operating room fires, this has been classified by ASA that operating room fires that occurs when the patient is under anesthesia and laser surgeries are itself high risk because the oxidizer enriched atmosphere that occurs in these surgeries. Now uh, the oxidant source, our main thing is that the oxygen should be kept as low as clinically feasible uh, and nitrous oxide should not be considered as an inert gas because nitrous oxide does an exothermic reaction and liberates oxygen. And volatile anesthetics are not flammable nowadays and are, the range of flammability is much higher than the range at which we maintain the alveolar concentration. Now here is the uh, operating room fire algorithm that has been given by ASA, the most important thing is that the surgeon and the anesthesia should devise a team plan and team role of what to do if there is a fire and before using laser, uh, before using laser by the surgeon, they should announce the intent to use an ignition source. We should reduce the FIO to the minimum and we should stop the use of nitrous if we were using it. Now, suppose there is an airway fire, we have to immediately halt the procedure. We immediately halt the procedure without waiting and we should remove the endotracheal tube, stop all the airway gases to remove the sponges and pour saline into the airway. That is why another good practice is to keep a 100 ml or a 50 ml of saline loaded in a syringe to immediately pour into it. Now we have to, after extinguishing the fire, we have to mask ventilate the patient and then we will have to assess the patient status. And uh, later on, we might require a uh, rigid bronchoscopy to remove any soot particles that have insert that have in uh, that has went into the trachea. Now, uh, the now since we have discussed about we have discussed till now about the laser and its hazards because laser tubes are used in laryngeal surgeries. Now we're going to discuss about other techniques that are the methods of apneic ventilation, tubeless ventilation, which are also, is also commonly done in the uh, laryngeal surgeries. Now, uh, coming to the spontaneous ventilation, it is done in pediatric cases or also in short laryngeal procedures or removal of any foreign body. This is a good method because there is no fuel source present and infants and children it is done mostly because we are unable to pass a tube or if we pass a tube, the obscures the lesion and makes it difficult for the surgeon. Now, uh, for spontaneous ventilation, we'll use 100% oxygen plus sevoflurane as it is not an irritant. And uh, before, after induction, uh, we have to make sure that before insertion of an rigid laryngoscope, the airway is nicely topicalized. Now, the ventilation will be continued 
by the patient. But to make, maintain the anesthesia, we can either use an insufflation technique, which will be discussed later on the next slide, or we can buy a total intravenous anesthesia. Now, this insufflation technique is to maintain the oxygenation of the person and not much about the ventilation and the carbon dioxide removal. Now, here what happens, we'll place a catheter in the nasopharynx above the laryngeal opening and this tracheal tube is cut short or the retinopharyngeal airway or through the right side arm or a channel of a laryngoscope. Now, this method works by the, by the mechanism of apneic ventilation where the oxygen will be absorbed, the absorption of oxygen is much higher than the removal, than the production of carbon dioxide and thus by diffusion, it will pass into the uh, alveoli. Uh, now the problem is that if the catheter is uh, placed in a wrong, in a wrong direction, then we might have an issue with the gastric distension and regurgitation. Now the disadvantages include that the, there is a lack of control lack of control over ventilation, the potential for airway soiling, and the OR pollution. This is not suitable for large and floppy lesions in the supraglottis. Now, the intermittent apneic technique, it is done when a clear, unobstructed view and complete immobilization of the surgical field is necessary. Here, we'll induce the patient, intubate the patient, ventilate until the so we'll hand over the surgeon, hand over the patient to the surgeon. And once they are doing the procedure, which you've seen that oxygen saturation is dipping, then we will immediately take over and again ventilate and hyperventilate and hand over the patient to the surgeon. Now, the advantages include is that the patient, the surgeon will get an absolutely immobile field, but there is again a limited surgical time and there is an aspiration risk that can occur and there can be potential trauma due to multiple re-intubations. Now, we will come to the discussed topic. There is a jet ventilation. Here, there are two things. Uh, first is the degree. It will depend on the frequency of the jet ventilation, which we normally use a low frequency, and the location of the jet cannula, which can be supraglottic, subglottic, or intratracheal. The main concept of jet ventilation comes into play only when it can enter in room air and lower the delivered pressure, for which we have to maintain a patent airway. Now, again, as we have discussed, it is the route and the frequency. Now, the roots of jet ventilation can be seen here, the supraglottic, subglottic, and the infraglottic, uh, and the transtracheal jet ventilation. Now, the supraglottic jet ventilation, here the jet emerges in the supraglottis, the jetting needle is attached to the laryngoscope, and it allows a clear, unobstructed view. Now, the limitations include that there can, if there is any misalignment, it can lead to gastric distension, and there's a considerable vibration and movement of vocal cord. And as Menansar has said, the vibration and movement of the vocal cord can lead to a difficulty in the operating field. Now, the subglottic jet ventilation, we use a Hunsaker uh, tube, which is placed into the from the glottis on the trachea. The problem that comes is that this is a fuel source is present directly into the trachea, and this catheter fracture can occur during the laser surgery. So here are the two catheters which we normally use, the Hunsaker catheter and the uh, and this Medutronic catheter. Here we can see there is a green tip holding the catheter and the steel wire inside. And in case any laser injury is there, this tip, if it is broken and does not get detached and fragment doesn't get fragmented into the trachea. Now the transtracheal jet ventilation, it is the elective procedure can be it can be done as an elective procedure and most importantly it can be done as an emergency cannot intubate cannot oxygenate situation uh, but the issues that come are the greatest risk of barotrauma is there if we do not maintain a patent airway and there is a blockage kinking risk with the catheter so here we are seeing a low frequency jet ventilator and here is a 16 gauge cannula through which we are transtracheally ventilating this puncture points at the level of the crico thyroid uh, membrane. Now, uh, here are the low frequency jet ventilation, the one we saw in the previous picture, here is the manujet ventilator it was. And here we have a reducing valve and a pressure regulator to reduce the pressure to less than 50 PSI. The cannula should be short, narrow and non-compliant. And we will provide eight to 10 breaths per minute for ventilation and carbon dioxide removal. And the actual delivered volume will depend upon the amount of air entrained. Now, here is a photo of the jet ventilator. The important parts are this is a pressure gauge. 
indicating the pressure which you are providing and depending upon the color there is a pressure regulator here is the oxygen hose connected to the wall and here is the trigger by which we can provide the number of breaths we can we can also select the in, in uh, inspiration expiration frequency and the ratio and here is a connecting tube to connect into the catheter now he, this is an image from our own department here again we can see the same thing is an oxygen hose there is a handheld ventilator this is the trigger this is the gauge this is the tubing and this is the cannula it's a cricothyrotomy set cannula the same image and the high frequency jet ventilators are not usually used because of the risk of barotrauma and also because of inadequate ventilation removal of carbon dioxide so the disadvantages of jet ventilation include the absence of room air entrainment can lead to these complications. If we prevent this, then most of the complications are avoided. And the mucosal dehydration and inspicited secretions from the dye jetting gases and also are unable to measure the ETCO2. Now the important one is the transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange. Here there the what this is actually a high flow nasal oxygenation. And here we will allow the apneic ventilation to occur and we'll use a high flow rate, which will oxygenate the whole of the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. And uh, it will also provide a, uh, it will also remove the resistance from the upper part of the airway. And we have seen the apnea time increases from three minutes. It can increase up to 14 minutes if we use this thrive. And the airway patency must be maintained. So here is a photo where we are doing a laryngoscopy using a HFNO or a thrive technique. And the post-operative concerns uh, with this patient are that the patient should be monitored closely for his strider wheezing or any signs of obstruction. And the most microlaryngeal surgeries, which we have discussed, are performed as daycare surgeries. And if there is any local edema or hemorrhage, we need to secure an airway immediately and assess the patient. Uh, very thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. Absolutely, a very comprehensive presentation by Dr. Neharika and a very well moderated by Dr. Vimmi. And uh, to start with a question answer session, I'll request Dr. Menon to ask the question from all our anesthetists from a surgeon's perspective, please, sir. Dr. Menon, sir, first. Now, or at the end of the session? Sir, uh, we have decided, I think, that uh, after the lecture, uh, the questions need to be asked. And at the end of the session, uh, anything which are available in the chat box will be answered, sir. Am I right, Sanjay? Yes, Any? yes, 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 we'll do that. Okay. Maran, sir, this is what the anesthetist does. And uh, we want to know your perspective with respect to the I mean, lecture which has been presented by you. Uh, I'm sure they, they are both <laughs> gelling very well. And many of the things were, in fact, uh, briefly were... Uh, told by you also. Yeah, right. So any particular uh, thing or from a, from the ENT surgeon point of view, the technique in which you are more comfortable, sir? Yeah. Yeah, what I'm, uh, what I wanted to ask first was that, you know, uh, uh, about the anatomy and all, you know, is there a, uh, generally are the anesthetist, anesthetist trainees, are they very comfortable with the anatomy of the larynx in the beginning itself, rather than just glottis and uh, a vocal cord alone. Do they actually get uh, trained in the anatomy and physiology of the larynx? Um, yes, they sir. do. Yes, they do. Absolutely. I, th I think that, that that is very important point yes. to understand because uh, uh, whatever may be the, the, the technique use, what is important is that there shouldn't be any 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 inadvertent injury to the, the the major structure. And also, it is better to have an idea which whole area we are actually safe to go, and which whole area we are actually should be very careful to go like that. You know, all these concept uh, is very important. Suppose, uh, you see, when you when you go to glottic web surgery. Uh, and uh, I, I hope I do, uh, when they do this glottic web and keel, uh, do you take any special uh, precaution uh, to not to then to dislodge the uh, the keel or any stent they keep? Anything special uh, thing, something like that? 
I'm just out of asking out of curiosity nothing it's not a question or anything that I'm just no, asking. No uh, actually uh, Dr. Jayakumar we uh, previously we used to do the keel insertion surgeries using an endotracheal tube and you know intermittent apneic ventilation yeah. and in fact uh, like you mentioned there was one uh, incident where the keel got displaced and it was cannot ventilate cannot intubate situation absolutely yeah. so that patient because they could not the ENT surgeons could not dislodge the keel they had to do an emergency in uh, tracheostomy in that patient so ultimately the patient managed to be all right and discharged but like you rightly said this can be very tricky the surgery and now recently we've been doing the keel insertion using the thrive technique and we get uh, the surgeon gets approximately almost 18 to 20 minutes of you know, operating time, which is enough for uh, their procedure. So we are uh, increasingly using that technique to do this surgery. And I think because they have a lot of room to operate on, the chances of it being dislodged is much less. And even the preoperative evaluation of the glottis, that they are able to assess exactly how much the deviation is, how much space is there and how, how what kind of a uh, kind of a keel they should insert. And that has helped them a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Neha, Sir? Uh, you have presented uh, the algorithm, the ASA algorithm about the, if in case there is a fire because of a laser. Do yes. you think there can be uh, any improvisation done in that? Um, Anything which you feel that is missing in that and which should be an essential thing? Sir, the, the in the beginning, the draping of the draping around the laryngoscope around the airway and uh, of the eyes and the uh, drapes that is important then also uh, announcement that is mostly mentioned and what it's needs to be done huh, what needs mentioned. to be done after there is an airway fire that is most important like uh, first we have to remove any uh, remove the source and extinguish the source and as soon as the source is extinguished we have to secure the airway ventilate the patient and okay. make sure that uh, from the airway side it is clear and make sure the origin of the fire whether it's originating at that point or from anywhere else if it's from anywhere else we are safe to go with the airway but if it's My from question. that source we have to extinguish. okay Arika, what i feel is the improvisation has to be done at a point when you say that we have to douse the fire right if there isn't a fire, you have taken out the endotracheal tube, you have to douse the fire. And for that, what I feel is that uh, there should be a kind of an, a small bucket kind of thing available to you with the half filled with water so that you can immediately immerse that particular uh, I mean, object which is uh, mm -hmm. which has caught on a fire into that water. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, because in the lack of uh, uh, presence of water kind of a thing, you will be either, I mean, giving that particular endotracheal tube to some other person to take it away from the OT because it is, uh, I mean, on fire and you are more concerned about the airway. Mm -hmm. So there I feel that uh, there should be, they should also clearly mention in the algorithm that during, once you are doing laser surgeries, there should be uh, some kind of a uh, storage of water, maybe half bucket kind of storage should be available. For mm -hmm. God forbidden, for any kind of a uh, fire accident, you can immediately put that particular thing into the, uh, that uh, water so that it extinguishes immediately because as anesthesiologist your primary concern at that time is solely for the protection of the airway yes sir. So, Dr. Pata, yeah. so that's what Niharika also said so we keep a 50 ml syringe filled with sterile saline and yes. we also keep an open bottle of saline so okay. that because it also needs to be a sterile because it's a sterile area so yes. we keep an open bottle of saline and a 50 ml syringe of saline ready in case of an airway fire. Very true. Thank you. Did, did any one of you ever have actually a laser fire? No, no. No, no, never. Not yet. Fingers crossed. Yeah, no. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so, in I, fact, I had actually seen one while I, I was in Ireland, uh, but that was not a laryngeal surgery. It actually was a uh, obstructive sleep apnea, palatal surgery. It was a, uh, the surgeon was using an ND laser. Okay. Uh, but they, but every protocol was followed. They immediately uh, doused the fire, uh, pulled out the tube, uh, poured water, uh, reintubated, um, resuscitated the patient. When then again they took out the tube, put the put the, did the bronchoscopy, removed all the the whatever charred material, everything was there, and then again reintubated. But that was a relatively a minor fire. 
So another thing, Dr. Jaikumar, is that often uh, we do not have the appropriately sized uh, laser tube also. Mm-hmm. And if these patients are tracheosmite, tracheosmites, we can use, we use a normal flexometallic tube. And what the surgeon does is co- through the glottis covers the uh, tube with uh, pledget soaked in saline. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's we often do cold, that also. Cold pledgets uh, should be actually, it, it will be right. a but yes. I think now there are, I don't do that. There are many surgeons senior who is very experienced with the, the micro manipulator, carbon dioxide laser. They actually do the surgery with the conventional endotracheal tube. Yeah, they because do it, that. Is but... it, it is an absolute laser. This is a precision laser. There is no cost right. of them, them because that is not a, there is no human error. It is actually the machine guided. It actually go there. But I don't do that. I still don't have that connection. Yes. That we, we also don't do that. We don't take a chance. So... <laughs> Okay, Niharika, I have one question for you. Can you explain the physiology behind apneic oxygenation? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the uh, apneic oxygenation actually takes place when we are not actively ventilating the patient, but we are maintaining a patent airway and uh, we are making sure that the air reaches into the alveoli. Now, the carbon dioxide uh, removal by the body into the alveoli is around 40 ml per minute and the oxygen absorption is around 250 ml per minute, 230 to 250. Now, it that is why it creates a negative uh, suction of around 200 ml per minute and that is why the oxygen actually moves into the uh, alveoli. Now, this is good for oxygenation but for uh, ventilation, but for carbon dioxide removal, it is not adequate and so there comes the role of the tribe. Yeah, so you're kind of all uh, correct but what in a more technical term what happens is that the important prerequisite in apneic oxygenation is that the patient needs to be completely denitrogenated that means pre-oxygenation is vital the Mm -hmm. entitled oxygen should be more than 95 percent so that all the alveoli are completely denitrogenated okay Mm -hmm. and once uh, you start the apnea period what happens is the alveoli which are filled with oxygen is extracted. The blood extracts the oxygen from the alveoli. Mm -hmm. So the pressure in the alveoli falls. And following that, the large volume of 100% oxygen that you are insufflating, Mm -hmm. that gets drawn into the alveoli. Okay, So that is how the mass flow of oxygen occurs into Mm -hmm. the alveoli. And like you rightly said, that the transfer of carbon dioxide back from the capillaries into the alveoli is difficult but it also happens because there is still a drop in the uh, alveolar pressure as compared to the capillary pressure of carbon dioxide so there is some movement of carbon dioxide but it is not to the same extent as the oxygen okay so that is the important point to remember for you as a postgraduate yes thank you yeah, so Dr. Sanish, uh, can we move on to the next lecture then? Yes, please. Ma'am, do you have any questions? Ma'am? No, that's okay. That was great. And <laughs> I'm listening to all. That's okay. fine. Truly, we had a whole lot of improvisions to be done when we didn't have the laser tubes. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I remember, ma'am, we used to wrap aluminium foil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, you must be also familiar with that. <laughs> All gone through those. Many of the things. many of the institution, it is still being done. Uh, but yes, are, I'm sure. I, I mean, it is being it's still being done over there. Right? I know. I, because... I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember in one patient, the aluminum aluminium foil got fragmented and was you know kind of it went into the trachea and then we had to do a bronchoscopy to extract that that piece of aluminium foil. <laughs> so all those things. Yes. But now we are routinely using laser tubers, so it's life is much yeah. more. Much. <laughs> so the next lecture is by Dr. Kushagrita Singh and uh, she's our uh, third year postgraduate student uh, uh, doing anesthesia and she has done her MBBS also from our institution. And the topic of the today's seminar is post uh, sorry, perioperative trache- uh, management of tracheostomy. Yeah. Kushagrita? Yes, sir. Good evening. Please start. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'll be talking about perioperative management of tracheostomy, moderated by Dr. Sanjeev Palta, sir. 
history of tracheostomy tracheostomy is one of the oldest surgical procedures which was portrayed even on the egyptian tablets dating back to 3600 before christ eclipius of persia is credited as the first person to perform tracheostomy in 100 bc first successful tracheostomy was, was performed by barcelova in 15th century modern day tracheostomy was established in 1909 by c jackson broadly the indications for tracheostomy are upper airway obstruction patients who require prolonged mechanical ventilation tracheobronchial toileting and the patients undergoing elective head and neck surgical procedures effects of tracheostomy in tracheostomy patients larynx is bypassed so the patient is unable to phonate but with the revolutionary new advancements that are made in tracheostomy tubes now phonation is possible there is decrease in the anatomical and respiratory dead space thereby decreasing the work of breathing there is loss of humidification and filtration function of nasal mucosa so therefore humidification providing in tracheostomy patient is very important there is increased risk of respiratory tract infections and the redundant area above the tracheal opening and below the larynx in which secretions can accumulate and fall back into the lungs thereby increasing the chance of uh, pneumonia Co foreign body reaction can also occur due to tracheostomy tubes causing local inflammation now moving on to the advantages and disadvantages advantages are as we all know the tracheostomy tube is better tolerated as compared to the endotracheal tubes there is lesser obstruction swallowing is possible it avoids endotracheal tube complications oral nutrition can be better provided in these patients and oral hygiene is also better maintained because you can clear the oral mucosa and oral care is easily done in these patients there is no need of sedation therefore the recovery of the patient is better it allows speech nursing outside our ecu is also possible and enhanced mobility of the patient is possible at the same time it causes decrease in dead space airway resistance work of breathing reduced incidence of pharyngeal ulcerations and there is even less incidence of sinusitis and vocal cord injury but the disadvantages on the other side are it's an invasive procedure it requires skilled personnel tracheal complications can occur like tracheal stenosis tracheomalacia there is risk of infection and bleeding psychological trauma can be there because of the tube that is uh, in, uh, kept in the neck for a longer duration of time and there is a risk of accidental decannulation which can lead to catastrophic complications the complications can be further divided into immediate intermediate and late type immediate are the ones that occur within 24 hours the most common complication that occurs is hemorrhage the others include apnea pneumothorax in injury to the reclaimed laryngeal nerve aspiration of the blood and injury to the esophagus the intermediate complications include bleeding displacement of the tube blocking of the tracheal of the tracheostomy tube subcutaneous emphysema tracheitis and tracheobronchitis atelectasis and lung abscess local wound infection and granulations whereas the late complications include hemorrhage laryngeal stenosis tracheal stenosis tracheoesophageal fistula formation problems related to decannulation thereby uh, causing prolonged tracheal tube uh, uh, tracheostomy tube placements tracheostomy scars and keloid formation corrosion of tracheostomy and aspiration of its content into the bronchus the tracheostomy tubes can be uh, there are different types of tracheostomy that are done one is emergency tracheostomy which is mostly done in case of difficult airway and it is even a part of difficult airway algorithm there is elective tracheostomy which can be done for therapeutic purposes or for prophylactic purposes there is a permanent tracheostomy percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy and mini tracheostomy which is also known as cricothyroidotomy now moving on to the types of the tracheostomy tubes tracheostomy tubes can be plastic metal or silicon type tubes they can be cuffed or uncuffed fenestrated or unfenestrated single or double lumen tube and the speaking valves that are available nowadays helping in phonation now first of all i'll be briefly discussing about the parts of the tracheostomy tube now this image shows a double lumen uh, tracheostomy tube in which there is an inner cannula which is there and it has a 15 mm adapter on the patient and this is the uh, sorry the machine and this is the machine end and this is the patient end the machine end consists of a flange and tracheostomy tie strings this is the uh, outer cannula of the tracheostomy tube there's a cuff which can be inflated with the help of an inflation tube which is further connected to a pilot balloon and then there's a one way valve which is there in front of the pilot balloon this is an obturator which is with a rounded tip which is usually uh, kept inside the tracheostomy tube while insertion and once the tracheostomy tube has been placed carefully this obturator is removed 
now the uh, cuffs the tube can be uncuffed or the cuff uh, tracheostomy tube the cuffs they protect airway decrease the chances of aspiration and therefore they allow a uh, positive pressure ventilation now the uh, differenti differentiating between plastic and the metal tubes the plastic tubes are made up of polyvinyl chloride they are flexible they can be cuffed or uncuffed they are usually inexpensive and they are uh, single time use tubes whereas the stainless steel tubes are the metallic tubes they are rigid they are uncuffed tubes expensive but they can be used multiple times but these tubes nowadays are rarely used now moving up on to fenestrated tubes they allow patient to ventilate past the tube through the upper airway they allow for the speech but when the speech is to be done using fenestrated tube the cuff should be deflated the inner cannula should be removed and uh, then only the patient is asked to uh, phonate now moving on to single and double lumen tubes double lumen tubes allow for easy clinic cleaning and they can be kept for a longer duration of time only the inner cannula is to be cleaned in this and only the inner cannula can be changed when there is soiling or disruption in the structure of the inner cannula single lumen tube has greater internal diameter speaking valves a tracheostomy speaking valve is a one way valve which allows air in but outside movement of the air is restricted it forces air around the tracheostomy tube through vocal cords and out of the mouth upon expiration enabling the patient to vocalize now moving on to tracheostomy tube care which is uh, which is very uh, uh, normally followed in our icus and has to be taken care of it basically includes 10 major headings essential and safety equipments for tracheostomy tube care humidification suctioning cleaning of the inner cannula of the tracheostomy tube tracheostomy site care and dressing change tracheostomy ties care maintaining of the optimum cuff pressure changing of tracheostomy tube communication and weaning plan and finally the decannulation of the patient now first of all starting with essential and safety equipments for tracheostomy tube care whenever we have tracheostomy patients in the icus or otherwise also regular checking of this equipment should be done on daily basis and whenever there is a change over or handover the change over of this equipment should also the handover of this equipment should also be done this includes a suction unit tubing a yanker suction catheters of various sizes sterile water and sterile bowl for suctioning sterile gloves aprons eye protection two space tracheostomy tubes mostly one of the same size that is inserted in the patient and one of smaller size tracheal dilators spare inner cannula rebreathing bag and tubing oxygen cylinder and humidifier nebulizer mask with tubing tracheostomy tube holder and dressing 10 ml syringe artery forceps sputum straps uh, catheter mounts and lubricating gel which should be non irritant humidification humidification is important because the normal pathway or normal anatomy of the airway is distor distorted therefore normal humidification is not possible in the tracheostomy patients so we should check for adequate humidification and document it every 2 to 4 hourly and the water in the humidifying humidifiers should be changed every 24 hourly if it is not and if it's finished it should be changed prior to that the methods include wet gauze on saline drip droplet delivery which can be mechanical or ultrasonic hot water humidification heat and moisture exchange now moving on to suctioning the purpose of suctioning is so that there is no debris present in the tracheostomy tube and the potency of the tracheostomy tube with the airway is maintained the indications include secretions in the tract increase in the peak airway pressures increase in respiratory rate or coughing gradual or sudden increase decrease in the arterial blood gas analysis thereby causing a decrease in po2 levels in the blood gas sudden onset of respiratory distress basic guidelines for elective and safe suctioning include aseptic technique is to be followed patient should be upright and their head in neutral alignment always suction with inner tracheostomy tube in place use the lowest suction possible usually 100 to 120 mm of mercury pressure is used preoxygenation may be required prior to suctioning due to possible adverse effects of suctioning oxygen saturation respiratory rate and heart rate should be monitored suction is to be performed for maximum of 10 seconds at a single interval and then again oxygenation is to be done and again the suctioning attempt can be taken the calculation of catheter size is important which is done internal diameter in of the tracheostomy tube in front internal diameter of the uh, suction catheter that is required is equal to 3 by 2 the internal diameter of the tracheostomy tube in mm that is in place 
cleaning of the inner cannula of the tracheostomy tube it should be carried out as needed but at least every 4 hours if it contains no obvious secretions it may be reinserted into the patient loose secretions are flushed with sterile water and with soiled or partly dried secretions inner tube should be disposed of we should not use the brushes to clean the inner cannula or to remove these dry secretion as they may cause a distortion in the uh, inner cannula thereby hindering the ventilation of the patient after cleaning of inner cannula comfort level needs to be assessed after the reinsertion and we have to ensure that the patient is not in distress now moving on to care and dressing of stoma site we should first assess the site for any redness or skin breakdown we should clean the stoma with q tip or gauze pair gauze piece moistened with normal saline solution topical treatment can be used in case there is minor infection around the stoma site new dressing should be applicable to stoma site once per day or per shift or it should be changed whenever there is uh, there is excessive exudate which can be seen in the uh, dressing dressing may be uncut gauze or sponges or pre-cut foam dressings they help to maintain skin integrity and prevent the infection which can further flare up and even lead to respiratory tract infections also tracheostomy ties tracheostomy ties the first change of the tie should not be done 24 hours uh, after the uh, the tracheostomy is done because there can be a dislodgement of the tracheostomy tube and that as we all know tract is also not formed till then so it can lead to catastrophic complications but after 24 hours we can we should change the tracheostomy tie series or if there is visual soiling even then they should be changed we uh, it is usually done to uh, if uh, when we are changing the tracheostomy ties in order to prevent accidental decannulation two people should be used or before uh, securing the new ties we should not remove the old ties in case one person is doing the change ties should not be too tight or too loose because then they can disrupt the blood flow proper fit is one uh, finger or two finger loose various options are available like twill tapes velcro velcro tapes or ribbon gauzes cuff pressures cuff pressure is to be maintained between 20 to 25 mm of mercury it should be checked in every shift with the manometer the cuff should be deflated 2 to 3 hours after feeding and reinflated just before the feeding and deflation for us uh, some duration should be done on daily basis we uh, basically we are using two techniques for cuff inflation one is minimal occlusive volume in this we start with a uh, lesser volume of inflation and then by keeping a stethoscope around the trachea we keep on inflating the cuff till there is no leak that can that is audible and then there is another technique of synchronized cuff deflation technique now moving on to tracheostomy tube change the indications for tracheostomy tube change are block lumen cuff rupture or any uh, de- uh, the damage to the tracheostomy tube the complications include insertion into the false passage which usually very commonly occurs when it is done before the formation of a tract bleeding is another complication difficult cases like in uh, people who are obese with short and thick neck they should be even prepared for endotracheal intubations for surgical stoma first change must be uh, must not be 24 hours and usually it is done between 5 to 7 days for percutaneous tracheostomy the ideally the change is within 7 to 10 days for subsequent tracheostomy changes 7 to 14 days are considered appropriate but sudden blockage may also be considered for tube change now moving on to this algorithm for emergency tracheostomy displacement in icu if there is an uh, if you have a concern that the tracheostomy tube is displaced we should this should come into our mind if there is hypoxia cvs instability big cuff leaks are seen and if there is failure to achieve set pressure ventilation the patient is uh, talking despite the cuff is uh, inflated and there is audible cuff leak despite appropriate cuff pressures so our first t- step is we will call for help 100% oxygen will be given to the patient etco2 monitoring will be attached if it's not there and we should call for difficult airway trolley at the same time now moving on to the second step we'll be attaching water socket now step 3 in step 3 we should first look if there is an etco2 trace we should see if the water circuit is moving with spontaneous respiration and if there is visible chest rise if the answer to any of the uh, if answer to this is no then basically it suggests a problem with tracheostomy at the same time we should even see 
two care we should try and give two careful breath breaths with the water circuit and we should again see for etco2 trace and for the chest movements if the answer for this is also no then it basically suggests the problem we should even look at the neck when we are giving the breaths because there might be swelling or developing of surgical emphysema with the each breath so if there is a problem with the tracheostomy tube is suspected then we should see if it's blocked we should pass the suction catheter via the tracheostomy tube ensure that the inner tube is removed now we should see uh, if the cuff has herniated over and out of the tracheostomy tube but if answer to uh, these two questions is yes then the tracheostomy tube displacement is unlikely and we should rule out the other causes for the reason that the patient is not being ventilated which basically includes examples like pneumothorax bronchospasm wherever in doubt in any of these situation fiber optic inspection via tracheostomy is the most important thing that has to be done look for tracheal rings and carina consider advancement over the bronchoscope now if uh, we have a suggested problem with tracheostomy we should deflate if in doubt or if the patient is deteriorating we should deflate the tracheostomy cuff and remove the tracheostomy and even after performing the fiber optic if we are in doubt we should still remove the tracheostomy now we should cover the tracheostomy with a sterile gauze and occlusive tight dressing should be done we should ventilate the patient with 100% oxygen using bag and mask and face vent face ventilation with goodles airway and two hands on mask we should consider the insertion of lma i gel proseal or lma and await for the senior's help and if possible we should try and intubate the patient which is the definitive way of securing the airway at that point of time when the senior helps arrive with the help of elastic bougie we should uh, guide the reinsertion of the tracheostomy tube but extreme care should be taken if the tract is less than 7 days old because then as already told it can lead to the movement uh, it can lead to the placement of the tracheostomy tube in false tract rapid sequence induction uh, and oral intubation is done moving on to communication and weaning plan simple means of communication between the patient and others should be done constant support and encouragement are important weaning from dependence on tracheostomy to decannulate is a professional decision many factors are to be considered patient assessment for successful weaning is done in terms of improvement in disease process which was the primary underlying pathology neurological status of the patient which is assessed in the we have the consciousness and the orientation of the patient the comprehension powers of the patient effective coughing and able to maintain the air can tolerate cough deflation and by capping and plugging should be continued uh, that is tolerated by the patient for more than 24 hours the patient should be hemodynamically stable chest x-ray should be clear and there should be minimal secretions now moving on to decannulation preferably decannulation is done in morning resolution of pathology that necessitate the tracheostomy should be reversed normal pr uh, protective laryngeal mechanism should be there there should be no plan for further interventions via the tracheostomy tube there should be no need for mechanical ventilation demonstrate the patient has demonstrated stability for 24 to 48 hours after discontinuation of mechanical ventilation deflating the tracheostomy tube and capping of the tube is done the ability to breathe and clear airway secretions around smaller size tube signifies readiness for decannulation patient who fail breathing trial should be evaluated for five, for endoscopy or for assessment for airway lesions and adequacy of airway function now this is the air decannulation algorithm first of all we have to as told earlier we have to check for intact sensorium successful prolonged spontaneous breathing trial characteristic of secretions and mm, need for suctioning should be assessed effective swallowing should be present effective coughing should be present and patient should have a patent airway now we can categorize the patient into two categories patients who had who required short duration of mechanical ventilation without suspicion of neuromuscular technique weakness in this decannulation technique is done in the way of cocking trial in which we block the uh, tube with the valve or in cases when the valve is not available we usually use the obturator to block and if it is successful then we decannulate the patient but if it has failed then we move to the second arm which is even followed for long duration of mechanical ventilation with suspicion of neuromuscular weakness in this downsizing and blocking in this we gradually downsize the uh, tracheostomy tube and then gradual uh, deflation of the cuff is done 
and then uh, we are assessing the patient if it is successful we decannulate but if downsizing and blocking is also failed then upsize the tracheostomy tube and we should resume the patient back on mechanical ventilation if required and fiber optic evaluation is done to identify the cause the equipments that should be available by decannulating the patient include dressing pack correct size of tracheostomy tubes usually we keep the two tracheostomy tube one of the same size and one smaller size tracheal dilators tapes 10 ml syringe water soluble lubricant 0.9% normal saline sterile gloves protective eye gear occlusive dressing and intubation trolley should be ready even the difficult airway card should be ready decannulation procedure patient should be npo for at least 4 hours nasogastric tube is aspirated baseline vitals are recorded we should explain the procedure to the patient so that the patient is comfortable positioning of the patient while decannulation is mostly upright or in the sitting position we suction the uh, tracheostomy tube and the oropharynx ensure the cuff is fully deflated and tapes are undone insertion of the suction catheter 0.5 to 1 cm beyond the tip apply suction and withdraw the tube out smoothly with outward and downward movement clean the site if needed place occlusive dressing on the stoma instruct the patient to cough while putting gentle pressure on dressing assess patient for any signs of distress emergency intubation trolley and tracheostomy equipments must be kept on bedside of the patient for at least 24 hours post decannulation and we should be supportive to the patient difficult or failed decannulation persistent of the condition that originate originally necessitated the tracheostomy anterior tracheal wall dislocation granulation tissue around the stoma edema of the tracheal mucosa subglottic stenosis tracheomalacia in coordination of laryngeal opening reflex psychological dependence on the tracheostomy which usually occurs in icu patients who have been tracheostomized for very long duration post decannulation care is very important in these patients and they need our constant support healing of the stoma usually occurs in 7 to 14 days stoma site is to be covered with gauze or an occlusive bandage application of manual pressure to the bandage during speech and cough is uh, advocated so as to reinforce cough and phonation frequent wound care has to be done and maintaining hygiene site, uh, hygiene around the stoma site is important now this algorithm also shows various tracheostomy emergencies that can occur in icu the three main emergencies that occur include decannulation obstruction and bleeding this decannulation is basically the accidental decannulation that is it is occurring if it occurs in less than 7 to 14 days then there is a risk of creating a false track so we should go for intubation of the patient but if it is late then we should try for a replacement of the uh, tracheostomy tube if there is an obstruction which can be due to various reasons if it is an early obstruction then we should attempt to pass the suction catheter and consider bronchoscopy if immediately unavailable if unable to clear then we should intubate from above but if it's a late late obstruction that occurs after 7 to 14 days then we should consider bronchoscopy if still obstructed then we should try to replace the same size tracheostomy tube or preferably a size smaller and bleeding is another emergency that occurs it can be early or late if it, it's a early bleeding which uh, can be due to the surgical side bleeding in that we have to inflate the cuff so that a, a direct pressure is applied at the site of bleeding if it's a late bleeding which can be due to a fistula that is formed between tracheo innominate uh, fistula trachea and innominate artery so in this case we'll over inflate the cuff to tamponade ventilate from above and remove the tracheostomy and we can intubate from above and we a surgical management of hemorrhage will be required if it is a very if the hemorrhage is not con controlled with all these measures so now lastly moving on to take home message tracheostomy care requires multidisciplinary comprehensive approach and regular meetings so that the tracheostomy care guidelines are uh, adjusted and updated from time to time healthcare professional must develop and adhere to guidelines at their institutions decision to decannulate the patient should assess multiple uh, features post decannulation care of the patient is also equally important thank you thank you kshatita uh dr bimmi you may please initiate the question answer session yeah thank you so much kushagrita and dr palta so my question for you kushagrita is that what are the important things to be kept in mind uh, while you getting a tracheostomy done under anesthesia yes ma'am ma first of all we should be assessing the airway of the patient preoperatively and uh, at the same time the patient uh, is already intubated the okay. patient is intubated and you're getting a tracheostomy done under, under anesthesia yeah? yes. so what are the important things to be kept in mind 
हम फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वेन दे आर मेकिंग द पोजिशन ऑफ द पेशेंट इन विच द एक्सटेंशन ऑफ द नेक इज डन एट दैट टाइम एंड इवन बिफोर दैट वी शुड इंश्योर दैट एंड्रोट्रेकियल ट्यूब इज tightly uh, placed it should the positioning should be confirmed so that the tube is not displaced at that time then we should be standing on the head end of the patient and emergency intubation equipment should also be uh, present at the with us then ma'am another major thing is that when the surgeon is taking the incision for the tracheostomy after the incision in the trachea has been made so we have to be uh, the cuff of the tracheostomy tube is deflated and we have to pull out the tracheostomy tube the pulling uh, of the sorry endotracheal tube the pulling of the endotracheal tube should be uh, gentle so that the uh, surgeon gets access to the trachea but at the same time the tube completely does not come out so that when we have to if the tracheostomy fails and we have to again Uh, at uh, uh, past the endotracheal tube we should be able to do that easily yeah kushagrita uh, the one important thing that you missed is that you should always ventilate with 100% oxygen yes ma'am if you just be attempted and also like you rightly said when you withdraw the tube don't remove it from the trachea completely just keep it in the uh, just above the incision so that in case there is uh, the there is a problem in inserting the tracheostomy tube especially if it's a difficult tracheostomy then you can reinsert the endotracheal tube so continuing the same line of thought uh, can you do some modification here if you want to prevent uh, aerosol generation especially uh, doctor, keeping uh, in mind this question uh, dr vimmi uh, before this question i would also like to add one more thing which probably kushagrita couldn't say and that is the importance of suction yes before before deflating the cup you need to do a proper suctioning okay, area yes, oral suction and only then afterwards you deflate the cup and try to withdraw the tube not the pull the tube out withdraw the tube slowly and slowly and keep it at the laryngeal inlet yes, and sir. not to take it out completely this suction part is also equally important for us yes, dr vimmi please for your next question Yeah. So, how do you prevent aerosol generation during a tracheostomy? Oh, ma'am, aerosol generation. So, so are you getting my point? So, as yes, soon as you make incision on the trachea, yes, ma'am. So, mm-hmm. see the whatever you are ventilating comes out of that incision, right? Yes, so, how do you prevent that aerosol generation and prevent contamination, especially pertaining to the infections, respiratory tract infections, or uh, viral like? Uh, infections like covid so how do you ensure that this thing doesn't happen even the splash of blood is also there yes uh, ma'am the positive pressure ventilation that we are giving to the patient at that time we can withhold that positive pressure ventilation and only the oxygen can be given to the patient at that time can you do something else besides that yes withholding ventilation is one what else can you do can you do something else so what you can do is actually insert the tube further down so that the cuff is much below the incision site okay so once the incision has been made and the surgeon is ready to insert the tracheostomy tube then you can stop the ventilation and pull the uh, the endotracheal or withdraw the endotracheal tube out so that the surgeon is able to insert the tracheostomy tube uh, without any hindrance right so yes, that is one of the ways because your the cuff is much below the incision site so there is no leakage of gases around the tracheostomy along the endotracheal tube so there is no aerosol generation and there is no risk to the healthcare personnel yes ma'am right yeah one more question can i ask you one more question yes ma'am yes. so uh, this i think uh, many of the us would be coming across such a situation when a patient who is scheduled for surgery upper airway surgery and comes with an endo, uh, tracheostomy tube in c2 yes, so it's a smaller size tracheostomy tube and it's an uncuffed tracheostomy tube how do yes, you induce anesthesia in these patients and first of all in our pre op orders we have to ask the uh, the tracheostomy tube change should be done and then we should ask the person that when his last tracheostomy tube was uh, tracheostomy tube change was done and after asking for tracheo- we should uh, ask for conversion from an uncuffed tube to a cuffed tube that is the preferred method that is usually done no 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 that's not the preferred method what do you do if there is no cuff tube the patient generally comes with uncuffed tube they don't uh, generally prefer to we don't generally prefer to use a cuffed endotracheal in these patients patients who have uh, you know prolonged tracheostomy tube in c2 
they don't have a cuffed endotracheal tube because the cuffed endotracheal tube can cause a lot of complications. Okay. So how do you induce anesthesia? Replacing an endotracheal tube, uh, the tracheostomy tube itself can be very traumatic to the patient, right? The patient That's is very anxious. There's a lot of coughing in all and it's, uh, it causes a lot of discomfort to the patient. So can you induce anesthesia without having to change the tracheostomy tube? Yes, ma'am. Then also we can induce, ma'am. First of all, uh, we should we'll attach the the circuit should will be attached to the tracheostomy tube, and hundred percent oxygenation is done by the tracheostomy tube. At the same time, the induction of the patient is done, which can be done either by IV drugs or by inhalational anesthesia. And ma'am, uh, then while proceeding with the surgery, we have to ensure that the tube is proper. Before only, we have to ensure that the tracheostomy tube is properly tied. And for giving the mechanical ventilation, the positive pressure ventilation should be so that there is lesser leakage around the tracheostomy tube, which occurs. Or if possible, we can do the packing also around the tube, tracheostomy tube. How will you pack around the tracheostomy tube? It's not possible. Um, if there is a leakage around the stoma site, if the leakage is not around the stoma site. The leakage is around the, the tracheostomy from the upper airway. The leakage is from the upper airway, not around, from the stoma. So what you can do is that you can induce anesthesia and ventilate through that. Uh, it is possible to ventilate. The only problem is sometimes because of a smaller size of the tube and the large leak around it, you may not be able to ventilate effectively, right? Because it's an uncuffed tube. So what you can do is to obstruct the upper airway. And how do you obstruct the air upper airway is to flex the neck completely. Yes. So that obstructs the upper airway, creates more resistance. So the air takes, the gases take the path of the least resistance. So more air goes into the lower airway vis-a-vis -vis the upper airway. So you are able to ventilate easily. So once the patient is induced, in fact, we I give neuromuscular blockade to all my patients and then change the endotracheal tube after three minutes. The tracheostomy tube to an endotracheal tube. Right? So that is one. Or if you're not comfortable with that, what you can do is you can in, give um, uh, xylocaine, instill xylocaine through it and make sure that the airway is anesthetized and then change the, and the tracheostomy tube to an endotracheal tube in the awake patient. Right. Or the third method could be that you can maintain spontaneous ventilation, induce the patient, maintaining the spontaneous ventilation, anesthetize the airway and the, anesthetize the airway using a local anesthetic and then change the uh, tracheostomy tube, uh, use, I mean, from tracheostomy tube to an endotracheal tube. Right. So these are the three ways you can go about changing a tracheostomy tube to a cuffed endotracheal tube. Yeah, Dr. Palta, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any, I think. <laughs> Madam, he has any questions? Ma'am, any questions? Ma'am? Uh, so just basically that the uh, trachea, the <laughs> tracheal mucosa should be anesthetized before we even touch it. So as you said, all those three <laughs> methods. So for the students, the idea is that your mucosa should be anesthetized so that we don't want any coughing or bucking while the tube is being changed. Absolutely. Dr. Yes. Jayakumar, any comments from you? Yeah, uh, I think uh, regarding the technique, I'm not telling anything, but I think postoperative few things. I think tracheostomy associated mishaps uh, is a known entity <clears throat> all over the world. So uh, one of the best ways to prevent is that, you know, you need to take care uh, to create a tracheostomy care team, which we do actually regularly because Many times it is not the ENT surgeon or the anesthetist who is actually seeing the patient. And the sister, the nurse who is actually trained in tracheostomy care must be there. So in, in wherever I go, I actually we have got a tracheostomy care team. Actually, we take rounds every day. All the tracheostomy in-house patients are uh, they, that are around this second. It's actually led by the ENT surgeon. Uh, there is the, uh, the, uh, the there is a nurse tracheostomy care nurse uh, and uh, many times a speech and language pathologist to to help uh, regarding the swallowing rehabilitation which many people may not be knowing and uh, of course if the intensivity is there great so tracheostomy associated mishaps can be actually brought down to practically to zero if a team is developed because it's very important that the nurses understand what exactly they are doing if they don't many of them 
surprisingly they don't and the problem is that in many of the corporate private hospital the uh, the frequency with which the nurses change is very high so within one to two years there is a new team come so they may not be actually so the, the training requisite training has to be a ongoing process otherwise the new nurses won't be knowing that's an important thing so we can actually cut down the thing then the second thing is that yeah uh, we talked about the tracheostomy suction and aspiration i think there is a tube called uh, blohm's tube which is which has got an inbuilt supra cuff suction cannula too yes sir so each time you otherwise when you deflate the cuff many time patient has got very uh, very unpleasant coughing and all because the secretion which was just above the cuff will actually go down so with this using this supra cuff suction cannula to actually we can connect the cath cannula to the supra cuff suction port and then deflate the the patient uh, won't be having much problem at all that's actually very good to which actually less expensive than portex so that's actually good to and uh, the second is that i think auscultation over the neck is a must for everybody who deals with uh, with with uh, the tracheostomy i think every intensivist should be every anesthesia trainee should be uh, to to instruct uh, to uh, taught how to auscultate over the neck and assess the airway obstruction after the surgery and especially also for decannulation so if you def if you deflate the cuff or if you are using an un uncuff tube and then you will have a reasonably very good idea whether this patient is fit for uh, decannulation by auscultating over the neck when the tube is blocked uh because there is a strider and and uh, uh, depending upon the facing of the strider also if the uh, anesthetist become comfortable whether it is inspiratory expiratory biphasic again you will have an idea where exactly we are actually having the obstruction what type of section is the patient is uh, fit for uh, swallow uh, then um, uh, i think about the tube i don't know what type of tubes uh, you all use uh, the uh, following the russia ukraine war there has been a big big shortage of tracheostomy tubes all over india that has been a problem for us uh, i don't know which old tube you use we mainly use shaili and um, uh, portex tubes for the adults and uh, bivona for the children i have an experience for the uh, pediatric because we have a separate pediatric icu but we are using the portex tubes Yeah. we are also using the portex tubes and i just want to mention about the last point that you said that's an excellent point dr jaykumar i also fully agree that all of us should be very well versed with the auscultation of of the uh, trachea and not which is true not only for after decannulation but also for the pre operative assessment yes often for patients who have subglottic stenosis or tracheal stenosis this is a very good parameter to assess the lumen of the trachea how much of the lumen is it that typical brassy sound of breath sounds is it, it tells you that the airway is narrowed even though the patient may not be in uh, you know obvious strider but if you can auscultate that brassy sound you know that this airway is trouble so i fully agree with you i think we need to pay more attention to uh, you know auscultating the uh, the area over the neck and the trachea right exactly one more thing which uh, at least as in a practice which i learned from my teachers and which i still follow in my icu is that i uh, make my residents learn for intermittent deflation of the cuff though the cuffs are now low pressure and high volume cuffs and intermittent decannulation for the cuff uh, making the patient uh, in a 35 uh, 30 to 45 degree cannulation uh, sorry uh, this position and second thing is that uh, when so ever the feed has to be given to a patient and normally we people are not involved the nursing uh, people are there to give the feeds but they i mean they tend to forget to deflate the cuffs do the suction deflate the cuff and then only the feed should be given which is which is what i feel is the better way to give the feed otherwise an inflated cuff is putting in a pressure posteriorly on the esophagus also though the rise tube has gone over there but still it is a better way to give that uh, you would deflate the cuff during that time when the feed is being given patient is in 45 degree upright position suction has been done and then once the feed has gone we immediately uh, inflate the cuff of the patient uh, so these are the two things which uh, i do at least uh, during my uh, duty in icus 
any comments from the other people around here yeah i think uh, that's important but actually the swallowing has become a very 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 big specialty over the last uh, decade or so deglutology is a very very big specialty there is we are understanding that pathophysiology of swallowing is much much better so that is why i told that the tracheostomy care team should actually contain a speech pathologist who is trained in the swallowing even though in, in general way what you told is perfectly okay because when you are when you are the cuff is inflated the trachea actually distends on the esophagus and make the swallowing difficult that is true but there can be a subgroup where there is already patient has got a laryngeal incompetence like vocal cords are not moving properly and patient can aspirate when they when they take the food so for those patient deflation of the cuff can actually produce aspiration so each patient need to be assessed thoroughly by the swallowing team it is all different but in general principle i fully agree with that because a very inflated cuff will actually distend the trachea and then press on the esophagus making the swallowing difficult not only that when the cuff is inflated the movement of the larynx the hyolaryngeal excursion which is the key to the swallowing because if the larynx doesn't move upward cricopharynx won't open up larynx will not come under the protection of the tongue base if cuff is too much inflated it is like the nailing effect the needle has the tracheostomy has gone through the skin subcutaneous tissue and the trachea so there is no laryngeal movement will be there and that is very very difficult for the swallowing and again selecting the tube because shyly has got a fenestrated inner tube and a non fenestrated inner tube so when you are giving a patient's feed you should be uh, you should take care to put the non fenestrated white tube uh, and when patient wants to speak you have to put in the fenestrated green tube so all these things will actually come into play so that's why i told that now with a, with a person who is a speech pathologist is actually the best person who is trained in swallowing a, an ordinary speech pathologist may not be of great use but i think everybody uh, dealing with the tracheostomy uh, uh, should form a team and uh, then the results can be optimal so i have a different take on it in the sense that we as anesthesiologists and intensivists uh definitely i mean most often are coming across patients with the tracheostomy in the icu and often these patients are on mechanical ventilation so i would not think it would be uh, very wise to deflate the cuff uh, while the patient is on mechanical ventilation because uh, one no no that's okay madam um, dr vimbi i am not saying in those patients but yeah. th these are those patients in which tp trials are going on they are on they cannot be decannulated but they are off the ventilator and oh. Th that yeah. subset of patients i'm so talking so these if they are taking rails to feed then uh, i don't think that cuff would make too much of a difference but yes like dr jaykumar said swallowing is very important That's so right. if you are uh, uh, starting the patient on oral feeds then until and unless you ensure that the patient swallowing is all right you should not try and deflate the cuff i mean it should not be over inflated but it should not be uh, completely deflated also because that can increase the chances of aspiration so once the swallowing is adequate you can try and deflate the the cuff as soon as possible because that creates its own complications uh, i'd like to thank our esteemed faculty who have come and spent their more than 2 hours with us this evening uh, thank you so much and so also the students so at the outset i would like to really appreciate the students who have participated today both niharika and dr kushagrita so uh, thank you niharika that's a certificate of appreciation thank from you. the ica to you and all the best for your future endeavor study hard <clears throat> and you presented your subject so well thank you ma'am <clears throat> and uh, dr kushagrita your lecture on the management of tracheostomy the perioperative management was also very well presented and this is the certificate of appreciation for you and all the best for your exams and for your future endeavors we are proud of you i'd like to give a big thanks to dr jay kumar menon from the ica office office bearers and from all of us and it's really it's very nice of you to have come and given your practical not experience but your vast experience in this subject of laryngology 
and uh, truly we were really very uh, honored to have you as with us tonight thank you so much dr jay kumar thank you madam thank you thanks to dr vimi and dr sanjeev palda thank, thank you, you so much thank for moderating much. this for session <laughs> so nice to see you all and sanjeev yeah. after a long time dr yes, vimi i met recently and uh, thank you very much and we hope to see you more often on our icu webinars sure, thanks fanish thank for hosting the show and uh, you've always been such a help thank you very much and good night thank to you to all of you and thanks to the clinic staff for introducing all of us thanks a lot and good night good night all the best thank you